Welcome, I'm Ben Spencer from Lightright Creative Digital, and this week we're going to be recreating this procedural snake scales shader. This episode is actually a request from Fred over on Blender Community, so hopefully this helps you. Now this is a problem which mostly involves UV manipulation, so we're actually going to be using only nodes that come built in with Blender for this episode. To give an overview of what we're going to do, we're first going to generate a grid of UV coordinates, then we'll shift every second row to the side by half a cell to create this alternating grid look. Next, we're going to cut out quarter circles out of the bottom of each of the bottom two corners of each cell, and use that as a mask for where to construct a continuation of the coordinate space from the cells below. We need to do this because we want it to look like the cells are overlapping, overlapping each other, but we can't affect anything outside of each individual cell, meaning that we can't push one cell over another, at least not easily. What we need to do instead is change the contents of our cell so that it looks like it's a continuation of the cells one row down. Once we have that, we can stretch our selection to the top of the cells so that they look like scales rather than circles. This gives us our final scale-shaped coordinate space. We can then use this new coordinate space to create and shape a height map for each of the individual scales. And then lastly, just to finish it off, we'll add some color as well. Starting with a fresh scene, I'm just going to use a plane for this, just because it's the simplest to see what's going on. I'm also going to use cycles for this, because Fred was specifically asking about using this for displacement, which requires cycles. I'll also set up said displacement by switching over to the experimental feature set, changing the materials displacement setting to displacement only, and adding a subdivision modifier with adaptive subdivision enabled. I went through that pretty quickly because I've already covered displacement with adaptive subdivision in the episode where we recreated the pattern cube example from SDF Nodebox. So if you want, you can check that out. I'll leave a timestamped link in the description. Then, as usual, I'll open up a window to the side and switch it to the shader editor. That should be everything for this setup. Now, we're at the first part of the problem, which is to, to tile our UV space. And I'll show you a very easy way to do that. First, I'll create a texture coordinate node to get access to the UV space in the first place. Then, pulling off of the UV socket, I'll create a vector math scale node. This node is the exact same as the multiply node. It just uses, uses the same value for x, y, and z, rather than having independent values for each. I'll set the scale to 10. What this has done is changed our UV coordinates, which usually have an X and Y value between 0 to 1, to values between 0 to 10. Next, we're going to pull out the output of this into a fraction node. What the fraction node does is, if you're looking at a number with a decimal, it removes everything before the decimal. So, 1.1 becomes 0 0.1, 2.2 becomes 0 0.2, 57.3 would become 0.3. So with just a scale and a fraction node, we've turned our single 0 to 1 UV space into a grid of 100 0 to 1 UV spaces. By default, the origin of the UV space, the point where both x and y are both equal to 0, is, the is in the bottom left corner. However, because of some of the math we're going to be doing later, we actually want it to be in the center of each cell. All we need to do to shift it to the center is, sub is to subtract 0.5 from both the x and the y. Do not subtract 0.5 from the z coordinates. That will mess up some of the math later. I did this by accident the first time I made this shader, and it took me a while to figure out what I had done, as the previews still looked correct because both 0 and anything below 0 are displayed as black. Now we have UV spaces that go from negative 0.5 to 0.5, but just to make them easier to work with, I'm also going to scale them again by 2. This will turn them into negative 1 to 1 UV spaces. Now we have our cells and their UV spaces set up, but before we can move on to the next step, we need to shift each second row to the sign by half a cell to create the alternating grid look. This is pretty easy to do, we just need to add 0.5 to the x value for every second row before our UVs go into the fraction node. To do that, we first need a mask for where each second row is going to go. For that, we specifically want to look at the y coordinates. So I'll pull out of the output of our first scale node and create a separate xyz node to get access to it. From there, we want to run our y value through a floored modulo and a truncate node. The modulo node is going to let the values in the first socket increase up to the threshold in the second socket, set to 2 in this case, and then it will reset back down to 0. This gives us a repeating gradient that goes from 0 to 2. The truncate node then does the opposite of what our fraction node does. Where the fraction node removes everything before the decimal, the truncate node removes everything after the decimal, leaving only whole numbers. If we look at the output of this, you can see that we have alternating black and white bands. This is our mask for each second row of cells. 
A final little tidbit for how the math works out here is that it actually doesn't matter which order these two nodes go in. If I duplicate them and switch them around, we get the same result. Not really important, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. Anyway, what we're going to do now is add a multiply node after our mask. I'm going to just set this to one for now. We're going to come back to this in a second and then plug that into the X socket of a combined X, Y, Z. Then add that to our original coordinates right before it goes into the fraction node. If I look at the output of the fraction node, nothing's actually changed because with a value of one in our multiply node from before, we're telling our shader to shift each second row one cell to the left. And because all the cells are identical, the outcome looks the same. But if I start to drag the value of the multiply node down, you can see the rows that we masked out start to move to the side. To create the alternating look, we're going to leave it at 0.5, so our rows are shifted over by exactly half a cell. Now that we have our alternating grid, we're going to change our cells so that they're scale-shaped. But like I mentioned earlier, this gets tricky because they need to overlap each other, but we can't really push one cell over another, so we need to instead change the content of each cell so that parts of it look like they're a continuation of the lower rows of cells instead of part of the current cell. Now the only way to do something tricky is one step at a time, and the first step here, as you might be able to guess, is to create a mask for the areas of the cell that we want to change. How we want to do this, if I zoom in on a cell here, is that we want to mask out quarter circles from the lower corners of each cell. If we do this for both the left and right sides of the cell, they're actually going to line up with the masks of the cells to the left and right, and will look like half circles that perfectly extend from the cells on the lower row. That's going to be the start of our scale shape. This mask is actually easier to create than it sounds. It's very easy to make circular masks. All we need to do is plug our coordinate space into a length node. What this does is for any x and y coordinate, it tells you how far that coordinate is from the origin, 0, 0. This gives us a circular gradient radiating, radiating away from the center of each cell. Now we want to move the circle to one of the corners, and to do that we need to move the origin. If you remember from before, we can move the origin with a subtraction node, so I'll add one in before our length node. Now if I start to bring the x value up on the subtraction node, you can see that it starts to shift our circle to the right. Remember that the coordinates of our cells range from negative 1 to 1, so to move the circle to the bottom right, we want to set the subtraction node to 1, negative 1. To turn this into a mask, we can plug it into a less than node set to 1. This node outputs a value of 1 to indicate true whenever our gradient has a value lower than 1, and a value of 0 to indicate false whenever the gradient is greater than 1. Now we have a half of the mask, but we need to add one more of these quarter circles to the other corner as well. The easiest way to do that is actually just going to be to duplicate our subtraction and length nodes, and then invert the x value of the subtraction node to negative 1. This gives us a quarter circle in each corner, but now we need to combine them together. Normally, you can combine grayscale textures that range from 0 to 1 by multiplying them together. But because the length node outputs values larger than 1, that won't work here and would give us weird results. What we can do instead is take the minimum of the two textures. This node just uses the value from whichever circle produces a smaller value for any given pixel. If we preview this, we can see that we now have our quarter circles lining up with neighboring cells to create half circles. So that's the mask mostly finished. We'll come back to it in a second, but it's easier to see what we're doing when it's like this. Now we need to figure out how we need to change the values inside of our cells to make them look like they're a continuation of the lower cells. The Y component is easy. The lower cell's Y component ends with a value of 1 at the top of the cell, so we just need to change the Y component of our cells so that they start with a value of 1 at the bottom. With how they're set up now, they start with a value of negative 1 at the bottom, so if we want to change that to 1, we just need to add 2. I'll drag off of our original UV and create an add node. Now of course I could just type 2 into the Y socket of the add node, but we only want to change the coordinates of the values inside of our mask. So instead I'll pull out of the socket and create a multiply node, and input our mask into one socket, and then I'll type 2 into the Y socket of the other value. If we look at the output of the add node, we can see now that the y coordinates now continue on inside of our masked area. Now we need to change the x coordinates, which is where it gets a bit tricky. If I zoom in on a cell, we can see that as it is now, on the left side, it goes from negative 1 to 0, and we want to change that to go from 0 to 1, so we need to add 1. However, on the right side, it goes from 0 to 1, and we want to change it to go from negative 1 to 0 so we need to subtract 1. Maybe what we need to do is becoming obvious to you as I spell everything out, but I'll admit that the first time I made this shader, this is what took me a little while to figure out. Anyways, if you haven't figured it out, we can split the values on the left and right sides by their sign, as in the values on the left of the cell are negative, and the values on the right are positive. I'll create a separate XYZ node from the original UV map to get access to only the red channel, 
and from there I'll create a sign node. Be careful though, because there is a sign node, S-I-N-E, that is as in the trigonometric, trigonometric sign, and a sign node, S-I-G-N, as in the comparison node. We want the one under comparison, which will output negative one, zero, or one, depending on if the input number is a negative number, zero, or a positive number. Now we have our numbers, but they're inverted because we want to add positive one to the negative side and then add negative one to the positive side. So I'll run this through a multiply node, set to negative one, which gives us the correct values we want. Now we want to plug this value into just the X socket of our multiply node here, but we can't do that because it only accepts, accepts a vector input. So I'll pull out of the socket and create a combine XYZ node, type two back into the Y socket and plug our X value into the X socket. Now if we preview the output of our add node, we can see that we have the finished UV map that's been extended into our masked, masked area to give them the half circle top. But we can be slightly more efficient here because we don't actually need the multiply node where we inver invert the value from the sign node. We can just remove that, change our two to negative two, and then change the add node to a subtraction node. And this gives us the same result, just with one last step because subtracting a negative number is the same as adding a positive number. The last bit we need is that our rounded tops here don't look very scale-like, so we're going to stretch them out to make them bigger. All we need to do that is to add a multiply node before our length nodes, and then I'll set the y value to 0.5 for both. Now it looks much more scale-like. Now that we have our final coordinate space, it's very easy to turn this into a height map. I'll start with the easiest and most obvious first step. Because the scales are layered on top of each other, we want them to be angled in a way that the tip of the scales are higher than the base. We already have a value that'll work perfectly for exactly that. The Y value of our new coordinate space increases in value as it moves towards the tip of the scale. I'll create a separate XYZ to single it out, plug it directly into the height socket of a displacement node, and then that can be plugged into the displacement socket of the material output node. It's way too much displacement as it is now, so I'll bring the scale of the displacement node down to 0.1, and then I'll add in a multiply node between the separate XYZ and the displacement node. The value in the multiply node now controls the angle that the scale is set at. The higher the value, the more steep the angle. I'm going to set it to 0.4 because I know that that's the final value I used the first time I made this. Now our scales just look like perfectly flat planes though, so we want to add some rounding to their surface. If we want it to be rounded, there will need to be one point where it's the tallest, and then it falls off from there, away from that point. So we want to use a radial gradient again, like we did before. So I'll create another length node from our coordinates. If I preview it then, we can see that we have a radial gradient again, but it's located at the base of our scales. That makes sense because that's the origin of the coordinate space we constructed. However, we don't want the highest point of our rounding to be at the base of our scales. We want it to be from the center of the visible part of the scales, so you want to shift it up. Again, if we want to move something around in coordinate space, we can do that by subtracting from the coordinates beforehand. So I'll add in a subtraction node before the length node and set the y value to 1.5. This moves the center of our gradient to the center of our scales. However, our gradient still doesn't really match the shape of our scales. It's perfectly round, but the scales are elongated. So we'll do the same thing we did before and stretch it out along the y-axis with a multiply node with the y value set to 0 0.5. The last part of the puzzle is that this gradient, as it is now, isn't going to do what we want for the height. It'll be the lowest in the center and then become higher as it gets further away. It's also going to be very pointy because this is a linear gradient, so it'll look more like a cone rather than a rounded surface. But we can fix both problems with a single float curve node. By default, it won't do anything, but if we switch up the values here so that the first node is at 1, the second node is at 0, that will invert our colors. That's one problem solved. Our gradient is now highest in the center and lowest as it moves away. It's still linear and pointy though, but we can change that by adding another point, which will change our line into a curve. The curve that you define in this node will end up being the side profile of the scales. I found that specifically setting the first node to a location of 0, 0 0.5, the second node is to 0 0.5 to 0 0.4, and then leaving the last node at 1.0 and 0, .0 will create a curve that works quite well. Now all we need to do is mix this with our other gradient, and all we need to do for that is multiply them together before they go into the displacement node which gives us this nice height map here. If we look at the displaced mesh now, we can see that we have our final scales displacement. But before I close out this video, I'll show you a really quick setup for the principled BSDF for the sake of completing the shader and to add some color. For the base color, I'm actually going to start with an RGB node for reasons that will become obvious in a second. Then I'll pull the color over into the greenish yellows a bit 
and then drag the value down to about the one third point. We'll use this as our base color, however it looks pretty boring and fake with just one color. So the reason I used an RGB node is that I want to drop a hue, saturation, and value node after it so that we can add some variation to its hue. I'll also create a noise node, bring its scale down to 2, and plug its factor into the hue socket. But now we have too much variation. With the random values from 0 to 1, we've got the full color spectrum. We need to lower the range of values created by the noise node, but the trick is that we still want the center of that range to be at 0.5 because that's the hue value that corresponds to our original color. To do that, I'll add in a multiply add node after our noise node. The first socket that we're multiplying by will be the range that we want our values to be in. I'll set mine to 0.35. And then the second socket is how much we're going to add to the value after the multiplication. The amount we want to add to center the range on 0.5 is 0.5 minus your range, in this case 0.35, multiplied by 0.5. So you're subtracting half of your range from 0.5, which happens to equal 0.325 in this case. And I just thought that that added some nice subtle color variation. Lastly, I'll touch up the roughness and specular. Looking at references of real snake scales, they're kind of weird in that they look quite smooth, but they also don't seem super reflective. I ended up bringing the roughness down to 0.4 and the specular IOR down to 0.35. Now, the texturing is far from perfect, and I'm sure you can make it much better if you spend some time on it. But the focus of this tutorial was on the displacement map, so this is where I'm going to call it good enough. If you have any questions or requests, feel free to leave them in the comments. And to Fred, I hope this helps with your project. If you're still hanging around, first, thanks for watching the whole video, but second, I'm assuming you at least enjoyed it to some degree. So if you want to see more videos like this, you can tell both me and YouTube that by doing the whole like and subscribe thing. Or maybe you didn't enjoy it, I don't know. If you didn't like it, I'd love to hear what you think I could be doing better as well. I always love constructive criticism. Anyway, thanks again, and I'll see you next time.